EMP Series Revolution, Episode 10. Ted Holmes walked out of the door that led up to the room above the trading post. The room that he was using as an office. The same room where the Regional Board of Governors used to meet. He walked along the train platform up toward the diner. Levi Connolly reached for the wire protruding out of his coat sleeve and pressed the switch between his thumb and forefinger. He spoke softly, subject heading toward diner. The high-tech mic on the other end of the wire was positioned just out of sight, on the inside of Levi's coat lapel. Even though he spoke softly, the mic clearly transmitted every word. The wireless earpiece hidden in his ear beneath his long gray hair crackled to life. Roger that. Watchman 4. Approaching Main Street now. Will intercept. It was the voice of Levi's longtime friend and neighbor, Jacob Smith. Jacob walked up the steps to the sidewalk and opened the door to the diner, just as Congressman Holmes was stepping toward the door. Thank you, sir, the congressman said, as Jacob held the door for him. Jacob nodded and followed him in. Levi keyed his mic again and announced, This is Watcher One. I'm going home to feed the pigs and have some lunch. Be back in town at 3 p.m. Watcher Two, pick up dock duty. Watcher Two, Roger, on my way, came the response. Levi got up and closed the paper sack that contained the bird seed that he was feeding the pigeons with. He walked to his wagon, which was parked in front of the trading post, and climbed aboard. He snapped the reins gently and coaxed the old mare to move north toward the edge of town. Ted Holmes sat at a table and was joined directly by Captain Crawford and two of his senior staff. Shirley Levin, a waitress who appeared to be in her early 60s, came over to the table with four mugs and a coffee pot. Coffee, gentlemen? she asked. They all nodded, and Captain Crawford said, All the way around, please, ma'am. When Shirley finished pouring, she went back to the counter and placed the mug of coffee in front of Jacob. Nobody took notice when Jacob tapped the lobe of his left ear with two fingers as he looked at Shirley. She winked at him and walked away. A minute later, she emerged from the kitchen with a fresh cup of cream and a bowl of sugar. She casually walked over to the table where Holmes and his party were sitting, table number two, and placed the cream and sugar on the table. In the hollow plastic knob on the lid of the sugar bowl was a tiny transmitter. Lester Grant, another member of the Watchers, entered the diner through the back door. He nodded and said hello to the owner, who was a friend of the group. He stood cooking at the grill and replied, Hey, Lester, help yourself to some coffee. Lester poured a mugful and walked into the office, which was near the rear of the kitchen. He sat at the desk and put the headphones on. He switched the receiver on and listened. He, along with Jacob, now were hearing everything that was being said at Holmes's table. Lester wrote down every word in a notebook. At the end of the meeting, they knew when the congressman was planning to travel back to Washington, what he was going to do when he got there and when he was planning to come back. They also knew that he was to meet with the governor of the state to try to convince him once more to extend the order for martial law in the region. They had a whole list of items of the group's agenda and schedules for various meetings, including dates, times, and parties to be in attendance. Before the meeting even ended, Lester had called Levi on his ham radio in the diner to fill him in on the details. Levi instructed him to get the notebook to him ASAP. Once he had the notebook, he would deliver it directly to Hollis Bellows, who would in turn get it to Carl Fairley. When Carl received the information, he considered turning it over to Arthur Lewis, 
He knew that, even though he was not affiliated directly with the company anymore, that it was in his best interest to maintain a good working relationship with them. He was prepared to fight this war on his own, if necessary, as he had told Lewis. But he preferred not to have to. He valued Section 7's support, and knew that if he needed them to intervene, that they could be a valuable asset to him and his group. For now, however, he chose to keep this new information within his own group. He met with Hollis, Tyler Hobbs, and Zeb to discuss what they had learned from the Watchers and plan their next move. Tyler Hobbs was insistent on knowing how Carl obtained this new information and considered it a matter of trust that he divulged the source to the group. Unknown to Tyler was the fact that Hollis already knew. Nobody else in the group knew about the Watchers, including Zeb. Carl explained to Tyler that he would not divulge the source of the info to him or anyone, that it was a security matter. This was a hard concept for someone with no military background to understand, and it frustrated Tyler Hobbs that Carl would not share this with him. Carl said, Tyler, we put certain protocols in place for everyone's protection. It's not a matter of trust. You have no idea what these people are capable of. If they should catch you or any of us, and they want to get information from you, they have ways of extracting it, ways that no one can steal themselves against. Trust me on that, brother. Much in the same way I don't tell anyone who wasn't involved in the op who were the ones responsible for taking out the base communications gear and generator, or who blew up the fuel storage station. Or, who took part in the op to free Frank on the train? And the list goes on. It's for the security of the entire group. And for the security of each individual. The more insulation each team has from the others, the better off we all are. You have to see that, Tyler. It has to be this way. Tyler just nodded. He did understand. He knew it was in everyone's best interest. Yet still, he felt left out, like he wasn't a vital part of the group. Carl couldn't help but consider what impact Tyler's insecurity would have on the group, on their collective mission. He made a note of the encounter in his personal log. He didn't know Tyler very well to begin with. He also knew he was affiliated with Bailey Bezio and his group. He knew there was more to Tyler's story than he ever let be known. This concerned him. He would keep his eye on Tyler and his team, as he had been doing. He kept every faction of the group at arm's length for the reasons he just explained to Tyler Hobbs. But, from now on, he would keep Tyler and his team at just a little further reach than before. Carl dismissed the group. He and Zeb made the long ride home together. Later that evening, Tyler Hobbs and his men rode together up the trail line north, about 12 miles. They crested a ridge, and Tyler cut the engine on his dirt bike. He held his hand in the air and made a fist as he coasted down toward the tracks. When his team saw the signal, they cut their engines as well. The five men came to a stop just off the tracks about a mile up the line from a bridge where the tracks crossed over the winding river some 30 feet below. It was the same river that flowed downstream and under the trestle that the group had blown up weeks earlier, the same blown out trestle where the train was now forced to stop. The train had arrived there earlier today, offloaded its cargo, and was waiting overnight before making its return trip tomorrow. This was the scheduled routine that the train ran on fairly consistently. Tyler and his team quietly made their way to the guard shack and easily overtook the two guards on duty without incident. They set their charges and blew the bridge quickly and easily. They left the guards tied up in the shack and started to hike back to where their dirt bikes were parked up the line. Tyler Hobbs and his men were well-disciplined and made up a cohesively tight unit. 
They were well-armed and well-trained, drilling together regularly. However, their one weakness was the fact that they lacked military experience. Because of this, they often had flaws and gaps in their intelligence and operational planning. In this case, it would prove to be a fatal flaw. If they had done the tedious recon, they would have known that the guards change shifts twice a day, once at 6 a.m. and again at 6 p.m. It was now 5.50 p.m. As Tyler and his team started down the trail, leading away from the site, a shot rang out. It hit the fourth man in the line. The 223 round entered in the back right shoulder blade, just to the right of the spine. It traveled through and out the man's chest. He fell dead on the trail as the other four men scrambled for cover. The two guards were on their way to start their tour at the guard shack when the bridge blew. They quickly freed the two bound guards and started up the line in pursuit of Tyler and his team. Now each side had four men in a firefight in the heavily wooded area. When it was all over, all four guards were dead, as well as two of Tyler's team. They approached the bodies and saw the team coming on duty had a portable radio with them. Tyler's team had disabled the portable radio belonging to the team on duty, but because there was no electricity in the shack, and therefore no way to charge the radios, each team brought a freshly charged radio with them when they started their tour. The men argued for a moment over what to do with their dead team members. They really wanted to properly bury them, but did not have the time. Tyler had to consider the very real possibility that the relief team had sent word to the base before engaging him and his team. We cannot take the time to dig graves. A detail of men is most likely on its way here right now. We must hurry. Drag our men over to the edge. Punch a hole in the jeep's fuel tank and let it empty out. There has to be something in the shack to catch some fuel in. Find it and try to get a gallon or so. Douse our men's bodies with it and push them over the edge and into the burning wreckage below. With any luck, the military will not be able to identify the bodies. The two remaining team members just stood and stared at Tyler. Move, he shouted. After they completed the task, they double-timed it back to where the bikes were parked. Tyler and his men rolled the two dead men's bikes off into the woods and covered them with branches and leaves. If we get lucky and they don't find them, we'll come back to retrieve them at some point. Let's move out quickly, Tyler ordered. The three men mounted their dirt bikes and rode off up into the mountains. <laughs>